Hey, this is Dr. Ben White, host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. Okay, hello everybody. I'm Dr. Ben White, in case you don't know. Thank you for joining our functional medicine discussion group meeting tonight with Dr. Peter Bongiorno on an integrative approach to depression and anxiety. I hope you'll consider joining some of our other upcoming meetings. October 26th, we'll be discussing integrative cardiology with Dr. Howard Elkin. And this will be our first in-person meeting since 2019. November 16th, we're gonna meet again. Uh, topic is prop most likely gonna be long COVID, though I still have to confirm it. December, we're gonna be off. And then January 25th, we'll start off the year with Dr. Bashtani. Um, I encourage you to partake Participate in the discussion by typing your question into the chat box, and then I'll either call on you or ask Dr. Bongiorno your question when it's appropriate. If you're not aware, we have a closed Facebook page, the Functional Medicine Discussion Group of Santa Monica. This is for practitioners that you should join so we can continue the conversation when this evening's over. Um, I'm recording the event, and it'll be included in my weekly Rational Wellness podcast. Um, the Rational Wellness Podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. There's a video version on YouTube. Um, if you don't listen to it regularly, please check it out. If you do listen to it regularly, please give me a five-star review on Apple or Spotify. And I'd like to thank our sponsor now, which is Integrative Therapeutics. And we have Steve Schneider on the line to tell us about a few Integrative Therapeutic products. Steve? If I can unmute. <laughs> um, I Like I always hate talking at these things because I know that everybody's waiting for the speaker to talk and they're way more interesting. Um, but But this one happens to be kind of right up our alley. Uh, and we have a few products that I just want to remind people about. Uh, and um, the big one is Lavella, which is our lavender oral um, and oral essential oil, essentially, for anxiety. Um, this is one of the products that we grow ourselves and market in Europe. So there's about 25 clinical studies on it showing um significant reduction in symptoms and similar efficacy um, to pharma products. It, it's the real deal. Um, the Really the only side effect to it, and, and Dr. Bongiorno, you might be able to Just tell us because people burp lavender. Um, <laughs> it's not the worst thing in the world. It's better than fish oil. <laughs> um, but we also have a product called Neurologics that includes uh, saffron, Cytocholine um, and a unique spearmint extract that's mostly for kind of a cognitive improvement, but it does also have a serious impact on mood. And um, we feel like those are sort of sort of connected. Um, and then, hey, of course, hey, there, Steve, there, Steve yeah. can you just address the concern that some people have about using lavender? There's this thought out there that's going to decrease testosterone levels. So, so this is one of those urban legends that we can't get to go away. Sort of, sort of like, uh, and thanks for letting me throw this one out there too. Uh, sort of like black pepper, black pepper in curcumin. Um, there, the la the lavender um, issue is related. Sort of, if you do a little Google in uh, searching, it all comes back to one doctor who had one patient who's it was a kid who used to bathe in lavender um and he got gynecomastia it it went away when they stopped bathing him in lavender um but there's really nothing to that other than it sort of is sort of snowballed into all of these references that basically go back to that same thing um we have a warning on it to not use it in prepubescent men 
or males. Um, but it, it's literally one of our top five selling products and we've never had any report of it. So um, if you know us, you know how conservative we are on labeling stuff. Um, if if there was any kind of worry about it, we would have it plastered all over the product and we don't. So and and literally this is one of the most uh, heavily studied nutritional supplements out there. Um, it, like it's over 20, 20 studies now. Um, so it's not something we're worried about. And if if we're not worried about it, I'm, I'm fairly certain you shouldn't be worried about it. So does, does okay, that help? Good. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Steve. Um, it uh and then you know the theracurmin, the curcumin supplement, that's a big one for mood and memory as well, all kinds of cognitive stuff. Um, we actually have a new one that's better than theracurmin called Caraleaf. Uh there's there's no clinical studies on anxiety and depression yet, but there's a great one on memory and mood. Um, and then cortisol manager, that's everybody's favorite for everything. So we, we always say that one. Um, so I'll throw some links into the chat. And if anybody wants to know more about them or sample any of these, we can we can make that happen. That's great. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. So let me just quickly introduce the topic and then we'll introduce our speaker and we'll get started. So we're going to talk about mood disorders. Depression is a mood disorder characterized by a Persistent feeling of sadness and hopelessness and a loss of interest or pleasure in previously enjoyed activities. Gallup research found in 2023 that the percentage of U.S. adults who report having been diagnosed with depression at some point in their lifetime has reached 29%, the all-time high, and 10 points higher than in 2015. Um, anxiety is characterized by feelings of worry, nervousness, or fear that are strong enough to interfere with one's daily activities. In 2023, 28% of U.S. Re adults reported symptoms of anxiety disorder in the past two weeks, though this was lower than the all-time high in 2021. Dr. Peter Bongiorno is a naturopathic doctor. Um, an acupuncturist in New York City. Um, and he also works with clients via phone and Skype. He's written a number of books, including Healing Depression, Holistic Solutions for Anxiety and Depression, um, which is an incredible book. And I'm reading it again for the third time. And there's just so many great clinical pearls, especially for functional medicine practitioners. Um, and he also wrote, how come they're happy and I'm not? And put anxiety behind you, the complete drug-free program. Uh, both of these are for patients. His website is drpeterbongiorno.com. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ben. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you for you know bringing people together and Spreading good energy. Really appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yes, it's my mission. So um, uh, it sounds like anxiety levels were highest during COVID, mm -hmm. which I guess is understandable. But yeah. it, it sounds like maybe depression has resulted from all this. And I wonder if this might even be a untalked about uh, symptom of long COVID. Yeah, well, I mean, I think there are a lot of um, similar underlying factors that that contribute to long COVID. And a lot of those uh, factors and mechanisms also play a very strong role in depression as well. So it makes a lot of sense to me that we're going to see, you know, this um, clinical and subclinical long COVID syndrome. And along with that, we're going to see more depression too. Right. So uh, let's start by talking about the neurotransmitter theory of depression and anxiety. For those who aren't, I'm, I'm sure we must all be familiar with it, but the concept is that somehow uh, depression, for example, is, is caused by a deficiency of serotonin and that specific neurotransmitters are 
responsible for these mood disorders and that somehow we can modulate this by taking medications that increase uh, serotonin or norepinephrine. Mm -hmm. um, uh, where are we in terms of this theory? Um, is it, is it has, have we learned, is there more evidence for this concept uh, or is it even more in doubt? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, in the end, it really depends on the patient, right? But, uh, you know, if you look at the, if you look at the literature, um, the New England Journal of Medicine in the early aughts, I think it was maybe 2008 or nine, had published a paper suggesting that maybe, you know, this whole serotonin theory wasn't true. And a lot more people who got, who took SSRIs actually didn't have as positive effect. And then, a, and then a few years later, a fellow named Fournier in the Journal of the American Medical, so I'm sorry, in JAMA, right? Um, right. Yeah, the Journal of the American Medical yeah. Association published a paper um, looking at all the studies that supposedly weren't looked at. Some people felt they were hidden, and that's why we didn't see them. <laughs> and when he looked at them all, what he noticed was that SSRIs really, for depression, mild to moderate depression, really didn't have a better effect than using a placebo. In, in severe depression, there was a beneficial effect, um, but not mild to moderate. And then really about a year and a half ago, another paper came out uh, strongly suggesting that serotonin itself might not be as strong a player in depression as they thought originally. And it's interesting because, again, maybe about 10, 15 years ago, there were some studies on another medication called Stablon, which is the opposite of an SSRI. It's a serotonin um, it actually helps keep uh, less serotonin around. And they found that about 30% of people did well with that drug, <laughs> about the same amount that did well with the SSRIs. And so that kind of, you know, people scratching their heads going, wait a second, one drug that does the exact opposite has has as good effect <laughs> as the drug <laughs> that's supposed to keep the serotonin around. And, and that's, you know, in my opinion, that's not to say that serotonin has no effect. What, what we need to understand is that you know, neurotransmitters are really, you know, if you think about disease, you know, very typical metaphor, the disease is like an iceberg, right? So neurotransmitters are the tip of that iceberg. So the question is, you know, and there are maybe 27 to 35% of people when they take an antidepressant, they do feel better. You know, it's, I mean, and I believe that's true. I've seen that clinically. So it's not that no one does well with it, but it's, it's not, um, unfortunately, the high rates that originally were, you know, that were being told to us. And the reason is, is because there's many, many other factors in depression besides serotonin. And maybe for 25, 30% of people, that is a, a, a major piece of it. But for many people, it's not. And then for the people that serotonin is a major factor, then we have to ask, well, why is serotonin low? You know, that when we use the drug, it does work. And that could be so many other reasons. It could be not enough amino acids in their diet. It could be because estrogen is low or other hormones are low or, or adrenals are off or thyroid. I mean, so there's a whole lot of reasons. So, so that's the questions we need to ask, not whether, you know, neurotransmitters themselves are the only reason. And that's unfortunately where I think modern psychiatry has been for a long time. And, you know, when you think about psychiatry, um, you know, I've I've worked with many psychiatrists over the years, and the way it's explained to me was that, you know, before there were psychiatric meds, psychiatrists themselves weren't looked at as, quote, real doctors because they didn't have drugs. So they themselves found them like they felt like they weren't like real doctors because, you know, when somebody got sick, there wasn't a drug to use. And then as the years went on, they developed all these different drugs. They accidentally, we, you know, it, they were unearthed that they had some benefits. It was actually, you know, in the beginning it was studying TB is actually how they started, you know, isoniazid and they started figuring out this whole idea of monoamines and, and the blocking of those. And anyway, that's another story. But, but the point is then psychiatry started having drugs that they did notice having an effect, especially for patients who were, originally put in sanitariums and kind of locked away. And, and you know, so like like the magic pill for so many other things, th that seemed like the approach to take. And unfortunately, 
that's still the approach that's being taken. And and we're not getting to the point where we're saying, okay, you know, th- this human being has a lot of part, a lot of physiology going on. And there's a lot of different reasons in that physiology, nutrients, hormones, inflammation, digestion, lack of sleep, you know, not enough exercise, too much exercise, mitochondrial dysfunction, toxicity, mold illness, you know, all <laughs> of these things that are going to play a role in why neurotransmitters change. So that's what I'm hoping, you know, as the years go on, that we're going to start to understand is we have to really treat that whole person and all of those issues. And maybe it is a neurotransmitter issue, but we don't want to just focus on trying to regulate a neurotransmitter. We want to figure out what the underlying cause of that dysregulation is, if it is a neurotransmitter. Absolutely. And it's it, it also sounds like there's a, a large number of neurotransmitters that have a number of different complex roles. And it sounds like it's not as simple as just serotonin for depression and just, you know, another neurotransmitter to make you happy. There's this complex symphony of various neurotransmitters that play various roles that we probably, you know, only scratching the surface on. And then, of course, we have the the problems with these drugs, which are number one, that even when they do work after a while, they tend to stop working. They're very difficult to get off of, and they have significant um, side effects, including a significant increase in all cars mortality. Yeah. 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 So that's, uh, you know, I, I recently went to the Connecticut uh, naturopathic conference and I, I gave a talk there and um, and one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. John Neustadt, he was um, speaking about SSRIs and the effect on osteoporosis, right? Uh, for example. And that was something that I'd heard a little bit about, but I didn't know too much. I didn't realize how deeply that those mechanisms um, uh, lied and, you know, what they how they changed osteoclastic and osteoblastic formation. And um, so that was something kind of new for me um, in the world of SSRIs, which, you know, I, I always think about them even from a hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis standpoint, how they really do change function. And, and I do find, you know, when patients are put on these medications, which, you know, sometimes in an urgent care situation where somebody might hurt themselves or somebody else, you know, sometimes it can be life-saving. So I'm not, I'm not trying to say that they should never be used, but I think at this point, the prescriptions are way outnumber uh, the need for it uh, by, you know, by a factor of many. And unfortunately, when you place someone on these medications, um, it does change the function of the HPA axis and does change the ability of uh, uh, and the balance of how the body uh, uh, regulates things like circadian rhythm, how it regulates the the production of neurotransmitters, how it regulates the production of receptors, and especially in younger people, I see that sometimes can make it much harder to actually treat them. You know, because even if they feel better for a while with the medication, um, it still becomes more of a challenge to work on the underlying issues. Because now you have this this HPA axis that's now been manipulated and 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 a change and changed a bit, and and that sometimes can make it a little more challenging to really treat the underlying causes. Interesting, interesting. So our challenge from a functional medicine approach is uh, is more difficult. Yeah. And, you know, and it's, look, like I said, sometimes, you know, if you have somebody who can't get out of bed, is thinking of hurting themselves, um, you know, when you want them to do all this nice testing and, you know, go to Whole Foods and buy some salmon and, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, they, they feel, you know, if anyone's ever gone through it, you know, it's, you know, it's nice to think about these things, but you just, you feel awful and there's nothing. So sometimes medication can get you out of that place and, you know, bless it if it can. Um, but it is a challenge, you know, to once once it's there to to figure out how to help the body kind of rebalance. Not impossible, but it's definitely, you know, I just think I think I think as functional medicine, naturopathic, holistic practitioners, and especially those of us who are working with the conventional psychiatry world, uh, we have to create a process, you know, and maybe a flow that allows us to question like, okay, do we need this medication in the beginning? Is it safe to start with that one? You know, can we start by working on more of the basics? Is this person monitored properly and they in a safe place? And, 
you know, are they, are they a single mom who needs to take care of a child and isn't taking care of this child? You know, we have to ask all these questions to find right. out whether, you know, be a little more judicious when we start using medications and see if there's an opportunity to not use it. Because I think that allows the functional medicine to work even better, you know, once we bring it in. Right. Especially as as you're describing in a case where somebody has mild to moderate depression, exactly. they're not suicidal, they're not in a situation where they're, you know, uh, air traffic controller or taking care of uh, young kids that they might not otherwise be able to take care of. Certainly in those situations, um, whatever you can do, medication, anything else to get that person doing better is the most important thing. Absolutely. Yep. So what are some of the most important dietary factors that play a role in triggering depression and anxiety? Is, is there a best diet? What, what, what sorts of things should we be thinking about? Yeah, well, when I think about you know, working with someone who has any condition, but especially mental health, I think about two things. Are they sleeping and are they pooping? So as far as pooping, the first thing I think about is, are the bowels moving enough? Um, because if the bowels aren't moving, preferably every day, um, it is hard to create balance with inflammation in the body, with toxicity, with hormones, you know, with nutrition, absorption. All of those things really rely on bowel movements and, and the bowels moving every day. So I find that that's critical. And we, we need to do our best to to whether it's to add fiber, to add water. Um, you know, sometimes when anxiety is so high, that can be a reason the bowel shut down because of course, when you're running from a bear, you know, you're not going to be sitting down to eat a meal. So the body, you know, the primitive brain naturally shuts the gut down. So, um, so sometimes doing things more acutely to help lower anxiety can be useful, whether it's through supplements or acupuncture, um, you know, just to kind of calm things down a little bit to get the bowels moving. So, so getting the bowels moving is is my first order of business. In a sense, I don't even get asked concerned with what a person's eating <laughs> unless I think it's constipating them too, because we just want them moving. You know, the body's so resilient and and we all know this, that the, we know people who can eat absolute junk and stay really healthy because the body just wants to be healthy. And, and sometimes with the right genetics, it, you know, it could do it even with poor food. Not that I'm recommending that, but, <laughs> and then the next step would be, yeah, you know, sit down and say, okay, what is it? What are we eating here? And what can we change for the better? And I would say without knowing a person um, or knowing their sensitivities or their preferences, if I had to pick a diet, I'd probably start with some version of the Mediterranean diet. Um, you know, Sanchez and Villegas uh, from uh, in Spain started studying the, um, the Mediterranean diet in the early aughts, probably about 2003 or four were the first papers that came out. And so many papers have come out since then. And they've really shown how the Mediterranean diet works on that endothelial lining of the blood vessels. To, and it really helps with inflammation. It really calms inflammatory markers, um, the benefits it has on anxiety and depression to both prevent and treat the condition. Um, you know, and when you really look at even studies on longevity and the blue zones, you know, people are pretty much eating some version, some geographical version of the Mediterranean diet. So, so that would be a place I would start in terms of foods. What are some of the other important dietary factors? Um, uh, blood sugar, we know, is super important. Yeah, yeah. So blood sugar is definitely, especially with anxiety, um, I find blood sugar re regulation is a key. I was, I was working with um, uh, a young girl who came in 17 with her mom and very severe uh, OCD and anxiety. And, you know, we talked a little bit and it was so clear that her blood sugar was so was so low. And then when I looked at her blood work, you know, her, her blood sugar was around 62, her fasting blood wow. sugar, which is pretty low. Not the lowest I've seen, but pretty low for a fasting blood sugar. And, um, you know, and, it, and because it wasn't high, no doctors really talked about it that much. You know, no one had mentioned it to her. Right. Um, no one looked at an A1C, but I bet you the A1C is probably around four, you know, and uh, no one really looked at insulin. And sometimes now in young people, 
you see these very high insulins because of all the highly processed carby foods we're eating. It spikes all this insulin and then it drops their blood sugar. So you have kids who really don't eat much nutritionally and they're still eating a lot of sugar. So you get this high insulin, low blood sugar. And that's so, you know, if you want to get the primitive brain stressed out and and, and create an anxiety response, um, you know, just keep the blood sugar low. And then, you know, in like this particular case, one of the other things that, you know, I noticed was that the ferritin was very, very low. And I see this also, you know, because you get these young women who are menstruating, you know, typically earlier and earlier, they're not really eating nutritional food, not getting iron in. Blood sugar is low, iron is low, and that's a recipe for anxiety. You know, by the time they're 17, 18, now they're starting to get really anxious and they don't know why. Yeah, this is somebody who's undernourished and probably has a huge amount of nutritional deficiencies. Yeah, and then because they feel that way, they're not focusing well. And then guess what happens? <laughs> they can put on they can put on medications for uh, for focus, right? ADHD medication. Right. And what does that do? That ramps up like their dopamine and neuro. So they focus a little better, but now the anxiety is getting worse. You know, and now we're in this like cycle, and it's just I, I tell you, and you see this pattern over and over. And uh, and I think to myself, gosh, you know, it's we have to work on the underlying issues here. We can't just keep this ongoing because now you have a young young girl who's otherwise healthy, and is now being told you have anxiety and and focus issues, and you have these you know these diagnoses. Now they're on a couple of medications for anxiety for, and we haven't fixed the underlying issues yet. Right. You were talking about the need for amino acids to be able to produce neurotransmitters. And mm -hmm. of course, that could be one reason why some of these medications are not effective in some cases, because, you know, you take a, a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which is supposed to keep serotonin around longer in the brain. But if the body doesn't have the right precursors, mm -hmm. amino acids and other nutrients to make the serotonin in the first place. Absolutely. Then, you know, it's, it's, it's doomed to fail. Right. Absolutely. So, so then the question is, you know, is the person not taking them in or are they taking them in and the, and the digestive tract isn't absorbing them? You know, if stomach acid is very low, um, you'll see, you know, you'll see people with a SIBO, small intestinal bowel overgrowth, you know, their, their stomach enzymes are very low. Their hydrochloric acid is low. They're not really breaking down their protein. They might not even be chewing their food very well because they eat in a rush and they're so anxious. And and um, so how is a person supposed to get enough protein digested for a good amino acid intake to make these neurotransmitters? Absolutely. And they may have H. pylori infection, and that's usually associated with lower hydrochloric acid secretion. So uh, maybe you can talk about the microbiome and its importance for... Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the mi and the microbiome, uh, you know, so that's the other side, right, of the gut, right? So we have the stomach acid being produced uh, in the upper gut, and then down in the lower gut, we have uh, a okay, cooking time. <laughs> we have all these bacteria that are so important, um, and the microbiome and the microbiota is just such a key to keep in balance to help produce neurotransmitters in the brain to help, uh, you know. Uh, keep inflammation balance to help process hormones in the gut. You know, the liver, yes, processes a lot of hormones, but a lot of hormones get processed and get absorbed through the gut. And the microbiome has a lot to do with that. Plus um, the microbiome, that good bacteria also creates a lot of short chain fatty acids, which has also a very important role in, in helping keep the brain in balance too. And of course, to make sure you get enough uh, amino acids, you've got to make sure you're eating good quality protein. Yeah. So yeah, protein is uh, a key, you know, and I tell my patients, especially first thing in the morning, when your digestion is as strongest, it's a really good idea when you have a good breakfast, have good protein. And But so many patients who come in, their their cortisol levels are so high in the morning and they feel so awful. And I've been through it myself during a very stressful time where my cortisol levels are very high and I didn't want to eat in the morning either. So I know exactly what that feels like. And so it kind of sets up the day where you're not eating in the morning, that your blood sugar is going to bounce around all day because you didn't get the, the food you needed first thing in the morning. 
And and now, of course, a lot of people are who are trying to promote their health are doing intermittent fasting, and a lot right. of them are instituting that by skipping breakfast. Yeah, and you know, and for some people, it's fine if their blood sugars balance and they're getting their macronutrients in, um, and their digestion's good. Then that could work for them because you know it does make sense. You give your liver a little bit of a break, and it can clean out and do a little more in terms of detoxification, but. For people who have that kind of blood sugar imbalance and their sugar gets really low, I, I do tell them the opposite. You know, usually like, you know, using that example of the 17-year-old with that OCD and anxiety, she probably needs less detoxification. You know, she just needs more nourishment. So for her, small frequent meals are better. But maybe for someone, you know, let's say a perimenopausal woman in her 40s, um, you know, maybe for her, a little more intermittent fasting and detoxification would be good for her liver, might help balance her hormones. So, you know, it's not like there's almost nothing that's really good and bad anymore. It's like, well, what's going to be appropriate for an individual patient that's going to really work for them? And that's First, really the personalized key. Personalized care, which is exactly. one of the keys to functional medicine. Yeah, absolutely. So yes, yeah, so intermittent fasting could be very, very beneficial. It just depends who we're using it for. Is coffee good or bad for mood um, Yeah, so... Coffee could be pretty good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, again, it depends on the person. So, you know, I always think about, I have a, my father's going to be 90 uh, and my mom's going to be 86, right? Um, they're Im immigrants from uh, from uh, Sicily and uh, my father can have four espressos and he'll go right to bed <laughs> and uh, no problem. I don't think he's had a day of sleep problems in his life. My mother you know, can drink decaf and, and be awake for two days. So, <laughs> so, so just, you know, it depends on you. Some people, um, their liver, and now we know there's certain gene genetic polymorphisms that will make us more or less able to process ca caffeine in a proper way through phase one of, of liver detoxification. And um, so, you know, coffee has definitely been shown to be helpful in terms of uh, cardiovascular health, in terms of liver health, it certainly gets the bowels moving in a natural, non-addictive kind of way. So, um, so you know, I ask my patients, you know, as long as the bowel movements aren't too loose, um, as long as they they don't have a lot of anxiety or sleeping problems, then you know, I think coffee is good. I drink. I always make sure my coffee is organic um, because there are a lot of pesticides in coffee, um, and I do drink it black to make sure you know there's no sugar, there's no dairy in it. And uh, so for me, I feel like it's health. It's healthy. Do you do the low uh, mold coffee as well? You know, I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> no, me but, neither. <laughs> but look, it makes sense to me. And especially for people who are sensitive that, you know, that might be a good idea. Look, I have patients, you know, that's something maybe in the beginning I might have said, oh, what's the use of that? But now I think about, you know, I have patients who are celiac. who, If they use a shampoo that has gluten, their antibodies go up and I've seen it. You know, so um, so some people are that sensitive and they need that level of care. So, so yeah, so it's it might be a good idea for some people who are really mold sensitive. Right. What yeah. about what about alcohol? Alcohol. Well, look, you know, again, you, if you look at the literature, the studies keep bouncing up and down, you know, about how beneficial. We used to think that generally a little bit was fine and beneficial. And now it seems like um it, it's landing in such a way that for cancer, any amount of alcohol is not good. That any amount, you know, depending on the person can help promote uh, cancer. Um, and that for heart disease, there doesn't seem to be much benefit, but there might be a small benefit because alcohol is one of the few things that raises HDL levels. <laughs> so um, so that's that's my understanding right now. I also understand that alcohol you know, has a relaxing effect for people. And I think that might have some benefit. Um, again, I'll bring up my parents, you know, my, I grew up, my parents always had like a little bit of Manhattan before, before dinner, not enough to get drunk or even buzz, but just a little bit. And, you know, when I think about that, I think now, you know, my father would come home from work, you know, he worked hard all day. He was a bricklayer, right? My mom would be making dinner and, you know, you'd smell the food in the air. They would make the Manhattan with a little bit of bitters in it. They had the gentian bitters. They sipped their Manhattan. They talked a little bit. They listened to some music. Then we sat down and we ate. 
you know, nobody does that anymore. And th- <laughs> so think about the the role the alcohol played. It, you know, relaxed them. They got the bitters, the digestive juices were flowing. They smelled the food that they were cooking. Um, you know, that promotes good digestion. Those are just all things we're not doing anymore. So whether the alcohol was tremendously healthy for them, I'm not sure. But the overall ritual and effect, I think, was. And and that's what I think is missing in our lives today. We're all so busy. You know, we're not we're not sitting down having a little aperitif, cooking our food, smelling our food, our digestions getting ready. You know, what do we do? We we order food, we're eating in the car, it's a quick meal, we gotta go, who's gotta go to practice? What you know? <laughs> and um, you know, so I think there's a lot to be learned from uh from the way we used to live. <laughs> Absolutely. And and herbal bitters is a great way to stimulate yeah. digestion. Absolutely. So stimulates, good for the liver. Stimulates pancreatic enzymes, stimulates hydrochloric acid, stimulates bile production. Yeah. And and the other thing it does is it it helps promote our interest in non-sweet foods, you know, ah, um, which I think is, you know, we're so used to sweet, sweet, sweets. And um, and 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 a lot of us now don't like bitter food because we're so used to sweet because, you know, the primitive brain <clears throat> wants sugar because sugar, you pack fat and you make it through the winter. Right. So if you have a, a winter where there isn't enough food in a primitive world, you're the one who's going to live. So we're so programmed for sugar. But the truth is, the bitters are just so like you're saying, it has so many beneficial effects on our digestive system. And um, and the more people can eat those bitters, the more they're going to um, be inclined to eat more bitters and eat less sweet. How so, important is sleep and circadian rhythm? Yeah, so sleep is, uh, you know, basically the first chapter of all the books I write. Like I said, if we're not sleeping and we're not pooping, it's hard to fix anything else. So no matter what any patient comes in with, um, you know, uh, it's really important. I ask them about sleep and how they're pooping. And if they're not sleeping, then we want to work on that because sleep is where we detoxify. You know, it's where our mitochondria break down and build back up and build better mitochondria. Um, it's where our lymph system cleans out. It's where our gut lining fixes itself. It's where the liver fixes itself. It's where the kidneys do most of their work. Because when we power down for the night, our body says, okay, now we can use our energy to do things we need to do for maintenance. You know, for years, nobody really understood why we slept. But now we know we have all this great information and research teaching us why we need to sleep. Do you get into analyzing sleep? Do you have your patients use a aura ring or some other device to look at quality of sleep and RAM and deep sleep and et cetera? I, I, you know, I do sometimes, uh, you know, usually a, a good patient intake will tell me what's going on. I mean, a patient knows if they're sleeping or not. A great question is, when you wake up in the morning, do you feel rested? <laughs> right. So so oftentimes they know if they're not sleeping. But yeah, I do think it helps. And I find patients do like to see the data, to see you know what their REM and non-REM sleep is and if they're getting into deep sleep long enough. So I do think it's helpful. And I do find those things for the most part correlate with what we're hearing clinically. I can't say from my perspective, it's changed too much what we do. Um, but I think it's valuable. And I think if it helps a patient motivate to, you know, make the changes we need to make, then I'm all for it. Yeah. What about the role of exercise in helping to manage mood disorders? Yeah. So exercise is definitely a key. Uh, if we're not moving our body, you know, one time somebody asked me the question, I had to think about it. If if you could only do one thing, exercise or eat well, which would it be? And and I had to think about that. And and when I thought about it, I don't even remember what I said as the answer, but when I thought about it over a couple of days and I thought to myself, well, if I ate well and just sat in bed all day, <laughs> I, you know, I would die, right? Right. But if, but if I ate crappy and moved my body, I think I had a chance. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now I'm starting to think, okay, well, maybe exercise is more important. I mean, neither is more important. We need both of them, obviously. Right. But exercise, you know, the point is, is that exercise is crucial and um, it's absolutely important for for mental health. There's no question about it. You know, when, when you get stressed out, 
right? You want to run, right? It's fight or flight. You want to run, you need to move your body. So when we have all these stress hormones and we're not moving our body, um, what happens is these stress hormones affect our brain and our brain starts to look around and says, you know, and our brain doesn't realize that there isn't a bear coming at us. Our brain just knows that there's stress hormones up and that there's something wrong. So, you know, if you have an average person who's just going to work and doing the normal things of a day, but those stress hormones are high, now the brain is going to start conjuring things, right. you know, and that's where anxiety comes from and um, obsessive thoughts and impulsive and all these things come from because there's something not right. You know, the level of stress hormones in our body does not make sense with what what our brain is seeing on the outside. And um, so so exercise is a brilliant way to try to equalize that while we're working on the underlying reasons we are that stressed out. Um, you know, exercise helps us build better mitochondria, which we need for our nervous system to work really well. Exercise, it's interesting. There's studies that show how exercise um, in the short term actually creates more gut permeability while you're exercising. There's a little inflammation and you get this transient permeability, but people who exercise regularly, what's been shown is they actually have less gut permeability because now the body reacts by healing it and creating a better gut. And, um, and we actually have better digestion as a result and less leaky gut. So, um, so many good reasons to exercise, you know, there's, you know, there's a study at the University of Copenhagen that came out of a few years ago and showed that people who exercise moderately, um, you know, by running or some kind of cardio work, the men live 6.2 years longer, the women 5.6, something like that, years longer. I mean, if if there was a drug that somebody could sell to you and say, hey, you spend $2 a day on this drug, you'll live six years longer, no side effects, and you'll feel better. Wouldn't you take it? Absolutely. I would take it. I, I would mean, take the, it. Longevity, I would buy it. The longevity benefits of exercise are just so many. It's incredible. Maintaining bone density, as you mentioned before, maintaining your muscle mass, your balance, because you know, as you get older, that's crucial for longevity. Yeah, it's it's amazing. And you know what's amazing to me too is that I never heard of that study in the media. You know, no one ever mentioned it. I never saw it on the news. <laughs> six, five to six years live longer. Why wouldn't somebody want to talk about that? Well, because there's there's no <laughs> pharmaceutical company that more, that uh, patented exercise and mm -hmm. hired a PR firm to get the word out about it. <laughs> yeah, it's just um, yeah, it's just not right. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about that. No, I know it's it's incredible. It's why we have a job, right? I mean, in a way, it's uh, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. It's good they did the study, though, because not enough research is being done on nutrition right. and exercise and these natural things because, you know, it's not easy to make a lot of money out of it. And that's who's right. paying for most of the research. Right. And a lot of the studies we see on natural medicines, you know, come from other countries because there are other governments who at least see some value in it and, it's put, <laughs> and the money is put in. And if you notice... Very few actually come from from the United States um, because it's just not a priority. And, no, I know. Uh, it's amazing. I, I interviewed Dr. Terry Walls, and uh, you probably know about her. Her story yeah, is of incredible, reversing MS. And almost all the money coming for her research studies um, is coming from private donors. Right. Exactly. Yeah, people who care. And are interested in, in, in making the a difference. NIH is just yeah. not, you know, really funding a lot of that type of research on using diet and exercise and natural methods for combating right. chronic degenerative That's diseases. Right. Yeah. So, um, what about uh, in today's world with electronics and social media? Is that something you address with patients with mood disorders? Yeah, absolutely. Especially, uh, you know, um, patients with focus issues and attention issues and especially younger people. Um, you know, I mean, these bright screens and I mean, look at what I'm doing right now. It's a uh, 1018 <laughs> in New York and I'm, and I'm staring at a bright screen, blue light screen. Right. I mean, that 
yeah, it's yeah, you know, we're laughing, but that's the right, that's the truth, right? It's, yeah, uh, no, absolutely. Right, right, right now, my melatonin wants to come up, but it can't because I'm doing <laughs> so. Yeah. And um, yeah, and that's that's an issue, right? And plus, a lot of screens, you know, there's a lot of fast moving things, and you know, and uh, you know, when you when you take kids out into nature. Nature is very slow. It doesn't move the way a video game moves. And so they they start to get anxious about it because they're they waiting for the next dopamine hit. Right. You know, because that's really what it is, right? It's getting addicted to dopamine and producing dopamine quickly and it feels really good. And then when it goes away, things don't seem as fun. Things seem bored and then you kind of looking around for the next dopamine hit. <laughs> and um, and that's the problem. And And some kids are more susceptible than others. You know, there are some kids, you know, there's interesting studies during the pandemic that showed how, um, you know, kids, because they had to isolate and be home, um, that, um, that that isolation and having to do things virtually really affected young women very heavily. And they tended to get more depressed and a lot more anxious. They found for young boys, too much was no good as well, but they found that some was actually more helpful. And that they that some of the gaming and stuff actually kind of kept them up enough where otherwise they wouldn't have been. So, you know, so every every kid is different and, and certainly gender can affect it as well. Um, so it's but there's no question that um, that we're all doing too much screen time and that uh, that's not great for our brain. And you mentioned going out in the forest. Forest bathing is is a yeah. wonderful therapy. Yeah, I talk about that in my books too. It's called Shirin Yuku, right? Yep. And um, yeah, and that the forest itself, the trees actually emit something called phytonicids and that we breathe them in, it gets into our bloodstream and it affects our nervous system in a very healthy way. It's very calming, inflammatory markers go down. Um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I mean, we're we're made to be in nature. You know, I remember yeah. when I was in naturopathic school, um, one of the... Um, advice uh dr mitchell one of the founders of best year university used to tell us he used to say you know i want you to go outside and just find your favorite tree and sit and and look at it talk to it listen to it you know get to know it and um and it's really powerful if you've never tried it sit with the tree and just talk to it a little bit and listen to what it has to say it's pretty interesting <laughs> cool um, so let's go into lab testing. Tell us about what kinds of labs you like to run with your patients yeah. with disorder. Yeah, so I'm a big fan of running labs. Uh, I think it's there's so many, you know, for mental health, like we were talking about earlier, there's so many factors involved in why someone's mood might not be right, whether it's anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. There's so many possibilities. And so we want to run some labs to figure out, you know, what we need to work on. So there's some basics that I like to run with everybody, you know, like a CBC, a blood sugar, insulin, A1C, a, th a full thyroid panel um, anti um, with antibodies, vitamin D, an iron panel is critical and ferritin for iron storage. And then looking at some of the vitamins, magnesium, zinc, zinc to copper ratio, uh, B12. Um, you know, sometimes you can't run everything on everybody um, because it's just too many vials. But what you can do is get a really good history and then start to narrow down. Right. And then usually depending on the patient, um, I'll run hormonal tests. I'll run tests to look at cortisol and adrenal function, take a look at melatonin levels, glutathione levels, mycotoxin testing could be very important as well. Um, and then looking at stool testing in some patients too, looking at the microbiome a little further. Um, you know, sometimes if I hear some basics are very off, like again, we were talking about that 17 year old girl with anxiety and OCD. If there's some basics that just aren't there, then sometimes I won't run a lot of testing because we know we need to get those basics in. You know, maybe a person needs to get to bed earlier. They need to start moving their body. Um, you know, they need to eat green vegetables. Um, you know, get, make sure they're getting essential fats in their body. So if there are a lot of basics not there, then sometimes it's not worth running a lot of tests because we know we have to, you know, get these in. And then if they're not better, then we could also run additional testing too. So um, everybody's different. 
What are, what are some of the favorite lab testing companies you like to use? Do you, do you send patients to LabCorp and Quest or do you use? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I use, you know, if we can work through their insurance and LabCorp and Quest is usually, you know, that gets the job done for a lot of the basic blood work. Um, there are a couple specialty labs I tend to rely on. Um, I do like the Dutch panel. Um, which is very good. Uh, but Genova also has some very good adrenal testing too. Um, I love Diagnostic uh, Solutions Laboratory. I think they do a good job, especially with the genetics, um, you know, and uh, using um, the Opus 23 powered genetic uh, profiles. Um, so that's very helpful too. Um, you know, the GI map testing is is excellent. Uh, Real Time Labs has their mycotoxin testing. Dr. Campbell has their mycotoxin. I think they all have benefits as right. well. So, um, yeah, so there's a number of different good ones out there. Those are probably the ones I tend to use and rely on the most. For um, nutrients, are you running serum levels? Or are you doing some of the specialty uh, micro my, micronutrient testing? Yeah, I don't do too much of those. Not that I don't believe in them, but just that um, there's already so many tests. And, and usually with a, a blood panel, I get a, you know, it's almost like you can't run them all, but I get an idea from the ones we do run. And then we just make sure we cover them all with their intake. And as long as I think somebody's absorbing, then we'll do. But, you know, I could see some benefits of running specialty labs as well. Give us some insights on some of those labs that are helpful and and how you approach patients. Yeah. So, you know, so you have somebody who can come in who could be very fatigued, right? And there are people who have very high cortisol and that could fatigue them because, when cortisol is very high, it bathes the brain. And especially if DHEA is low, then you'll see a brain that almost like it, people feel really tired and almost like this kind of floaty effect at the same time. And then you have other people that are tired and their adrenals are just flat. You know, right. They're not making any cortisol. Right. And they can have very similar clinical presentation. So, so running a test that looks at adrenal function, looks at cortisol could be very, very helpful. You know, because it can differentiate between those two things. That's um, that's really interesting because yeah. uh, we typically think of uh, cortisol being high as the person has trouble sleeping and they're and they're right. overstimulated rather than um, um, showing right. fatigue. Yeah, and I would say the majority of the time that's true, but not all the time. You know, so yeah. that's why the tests are so nice. And then, yeah, for nighttime when people aren't sleeping, it is nice to see is cortisol super high at night. And is that the problem or is cortisol really normal? They're not, but they're not making enough melatonin or, or maybe they're making enough melatonin and their cortisol is normal and it's completely something else, you know? So, right. um, so that helps differentiate. And what I've noticed is it kind of gets me there a little faster to help, you know, create a treatment plan that's effective. So, um, so that's why I like using, you know, tests like that because it, it can help to differentiate. And hormones, uh, do you sometimes recommend hormones when their hormones are low? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, hormones, you know, from pregnenolone, um, you know, which helps make both uh, cortisol and progesterone through one pathway and DHEA and testosterone and then into estrogen and another pathway, um, you know, all of those different um, steroidal compounds will affect the you know, the brain and and the receptors that the brain makes for neurotransmitters and the metabolism of the neurotransmitters themselves. So for example, you know, if a, a woman or a man has low estrogen, um, that's going to affect their production of serotonin and affect the ability of the serotonin receptors to be produced too. So, um, so yeah, we want to look at that. You know, testosterone, of course, is very important as well. In fact, you know, I wanted to talk to Steve about that. Steve, there's one test. Um, we were talking about lavender and testosterone. They did this test on animals. I have to pull it up. But I, re I remembered while you were talking that they looked at, I think it was rats, with um, who are given um, formaldehyde poisoning to affect their liver and their testes. And they found that, you know, these rats that were treated with this formaldehyde, testosterone levels went down. But when they were given lavender, um, it actually protected the testicles 
And and wow. they didn't see the the decreases in testosterone. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Really, <laughs> really interesting. Like, yeah, something yeah. to think about. So you so, mentioned men with low um, estrogen that they can uh, have trouble making serotonin. How do you address that? Yeah. So men have, um, you know, men have actually more estrogen in their brain than women does. So um, so estrogen is important, and that's why the panels look at estrogen in men. We don't see progesterone in those panels. So what do, you, estrogen. what do you do with men with low estrogen? Well, the next so the next thing you want to check is are they making testosterone? Because right. testosterone gets made into estrogen. So sometimes right. if that's low or really flagging, then right. that could be a reason. And then you want to look down the line. Are they making DHEA? Are they making pregnenolone? Are they making right. cholesterol? Right. You know, cholesterol is the first one that everything else is made from. Or, or so, are they taking, you know, uh, heavy statins and trying to get their cholesterol as low as possible? Exactly. Right. That could be an issue. It could be an issue that they don't have enough fat tissue. You know, that maybe they need, um, it's not common, but sometimes that happens too. So we see that as well. So, so you're saying your body fat is too low? Possibly. Yeah, yeah, possibly. So not common, but it's possible. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, so that, I'm yeah. sorry. Um, no, I was going to say, um, let's go into supplements that are beneficial for depression and anxiety. And I wanted to maybe start with NAC. I was, I was going through mm -hmm. some of the literature and there's like amazing research on NAC. There's studies yeah. showing it can be used as an acute intervention for patients who are suicidal. It can be effective for mm -hmm. severe depression, not just mild or moderate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for also for bipolar, um, there's strong um, research for bipolar, for trichotillomania, um, you know, which is hair pulling, um, which is basically like an obsessive kind of. What was that term? <laughs> trichotillomania. <laughs> Great word. <laughs> yeah, that's the word of the day. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, yeah, no, NAC, N acetylcysteine, it's a precursor. You know, for um, for glutathione, basically, and in its own right, it's a very good mucolytic. So, uh, you know, the perfect patient is someone who has some mood issues and are all stuffed up all the time. So maybe we get them off a of dairy, do some nasal rinses, and take some NAC. You know, for all of that, and um, it could be very helpful. Yeah, I, lo I love N-acetylcysteine, and unfortunately, it's something that's been threatened on and off for the past uh, couple of years, right, to be taken off the shelves. Right, yes. Um, yeah, um, it, you know, apparently what happened is that um, it was originally studied as a drug. Mm -hmm. So right. um, there was some thought that, it, it, you know, the FDA might ban it because of right. that, um, and um, so Amazon stopped selling it, but um, it's still being made. It's still being sold. Yeah. Interestingly, um, Amazon doesn't also sell CBD, right? Oh, um, really? You can't, you can't even get CBD on Amazon. And I noticed also Fullscript doesn't sell Amazon, uh, doesn't sell CBD as well. So really? um, yeah, yeah. Try to try to get it on those. You're not going to find it. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Well, so there's still that some, is. yeah, well, it seems like there's still it a marijuana regular. thing you mean? Yeah, I think there's still some residual regulatory issues about that. Um, I know, I know of uh, cases where uh, PayPal, like when people have stores, um, you know, practitioners have stores, PayPal will shut it down uh, if they're selling CBD. Um, so there's still a lot of things like that going on. Oh wow! Yeah, we're not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know, that's an interesting thing too because we see all this legalization of marijuana. Which I'm not necessarily against, but I think I think uh, the powers that be should have really taken a look at the literature and 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 shown that you know people who who take marijuana every day, um, especially young people before the age of 25, 26, when the nervous system and the brain is fully uh, formed, um, it really does affect in a negative way things like the HPA axis, and um, and I. 
I do wish, even though I think marijuana clearly has medicinal use along with CBD, um, I think it should have been regulated to be uh, legal after that age, um, because I'm very worried about people. You know, I have a daughter who's 15. In a couple of years, she's going to go to college. And most likely the state, the college she goes to, you know, marijuana is going to be legal for her age. And, uh, and I really am very concerned about kids and young people using marijuana every day. And the problem is now marijuana is not the marijuana from the 60s. You know, it wasn't like, oh, indica or sativa and sativa is a little bit stronger. Now it's this very, very, you know, high THC content, low CBD content. So now we're getting something that we're seeing a lot more. I'm seeing it now in my practice, a lot more cannabis overuse syndrome because mm -hmm. people are smoking what they think is reasonable amounts and now they're getting addicted to it. And now they're starting to get these syndromes, these cyclic vomiting issues, these digest, you know. So um, so this is something that's coming and it's going to be a big concern too. So something that I think, you know, has a lot of benefit um, can also uh, be a, an issue. Interesting. So what are some of the other most impactful supplements for mood disorders? Oh, yeah, that's what <laughs> Sorry, I got side <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, so, um, so. You know, if you look at the literature, right, and, and you say, okay, just from uh, meta-analyses go, for example, probably the top ones are St. John's wort, SAMe, curcumin, and I would say rhodiola, right? SAMe, um, St. John's wort, hypericum, um, is the most, probably the most studied herb of all time. There are meta-analyses of meta-analysis now on St. John's wort, you know, meaning that there's, uh, you know, meta-analysis is a study of studies. Now there's studies of the studies of studies. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And what's been shown is that St. John's work clearly from mild to moderate depression works just as well as SSRIs with less side effects. So, um, you know, we want to be careful with St. John's work because if people are on a number of drugs, it can affect the activity of those drugs through the liver it affects the cytochrome system. So you always have to be a little more careful with St. John's wort than maybe a few other things because of that processing issue. But, you know, there's studies that also show, for example, like if people are taking Plavix, which is a, a blood a drug for uh, blood clotting to help protect the cardiovascular system. Um, what they've shown is that when people take Plavix, and can't take more because of side effects, and they take some St. John's wort, they can actually get the effect they need from the Plavix without having to increase the drug. So as much as we're worried about negative interactions, we need to study more of these positive interactions because now we know there's benefit there. Exactly. So I'm assuming it's inhibiting part of the cytochrome P450 liver detox. Exactly. Yep, right. exactly. So and sometimes we can use that to our advantage. You know, Absolutely. As long as we know the medications patients are taking, how the drugs work, how the cytochrome system works, you know, then we can make actually good decisions and use them together. Right. You can use grapefruit um, juice also as a way to modulate. Exactly. Very strong. Yeah. yeah. Um, fish oil. Fish oil. Yeah. I mean, absolute favorite. No question about it. Um, study, you know, studies keep coming out about fish oil. You know, fish oil just supports healthy cell membranes. And when you have a healthy cell membrane, you're going to be able to get nutrients in a cell. You're going to be able to get toxins out of a cell. You're going to get tempered, balanced um, immune reactions because a cell membrane breaks, you know, when, when immune reactions need to happen. And that keeps it a much more tempered immune system. Um, uh, probably about a year and a half or two, yeah, it's probably two Augusts ago, right? So over two years ago now, there's a study that came out in, I forget which journal, I apologize, one of the psychiatry journals showing how in patients who are treatment resistant to antidepressants, when they take fish oil, um, then the antidepressants work better. So, which also made me wonder, did they need the antidepressant or did they were really just low in fish oil? <laughs> you, know, I, you know, actually one of the tests I probably started using more and more in the past couple of years is an omega check, um, uh, you know, a fish oil, basically looking at essential fatty acids in the bloodstream. And that's right. very helpful to see. Yeah. So you, you, what were those herbs you mentioned besides St. John's wort that you said? Oh yeah. So the other, yeah, the other ones I think are pretty clear. 
from a meta-analysis standpoint, showing benefits at, at least as equal as the medications. And, you know, and I want to qualify that because I said earlier that medications for depression work maybe 25 to 35% of the time, right? For depression. So, so I'm not even suggesting that the supplements work better. They work probably around the same. <laughs> so, so it still tells us we have a lot of other work to do, right. but I would say if you're going to, you know, as someone with mild to moderate depression, who isn't at risk of hurting themselves or someone else, um, you know, why, why would we start with a medication with more side effects? Why not start with something more natural to the body that can work just as well with less side effects? So yeah, SAMe, which is S adenosyl methionine, um, can help the body, uh, move some of the, uh, move some of the cycles that help create better neurotransmitters, especially if people have poor methylation. Um, you know, sometimes we'll see people with things like high homocysteine and they have a MTHFR polymorphism. And we know maybe if we support their methylation with things like SAMI, you know, you need methylation even to make like CoQ10. You can't, right. you know, it's hard to make proper amounts of CoQ10 without that. Um, so that's a very good choice for some patients. And then, of course, um, methylated B vitamins to go along with that. Yeah. And in the right patients, methylated B vitamins, um, you know, can be very helpful, too, to help move those as well and lower the homocysteine. And then I mentioned rhodiola. Um, you know, rhodiola has a, a rich history um, starting in, in Russia when it was first studied. Um and um, and that definitely is something that can be very very helpful. Um, it's considered a, a natural Comp T inhibitor. Uh, Comp T is one of the the genes that are that's important for how we break down neurotransmitters. So sometimes people who are very depressed, you can use rhodiola as a way to help keep neurotransmitters at a higher level. Um, so it's very supportive that way. And then curcumin. Uh, there's forms of curcumin that have been studied that have very good antidepressant quality. And um, and and that makes sense because it's a very potent anti-inflammatory. But um, there's a fellow named Agarwal who's done a lot of studies on curcumin. And he shows that there's so many more mechanisms than just the, the pure anti-inflammatory effect um, that creates some of the benefits. Yeah, curcumin's an amazing herb. I've I've seen some of the anti-cancer effects. And, I, and um one doctor showed a chart that showed like just like affecting 20 yeah, exactly. different pathways that all uh potentially could decrease your risk for cancer growth. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, might have been that same fellow. I don't know, because I know he's someone who's studied at a high level. And it's just amazing. And I remember him saying in this conference. It was a number of years ago. He said, he said, there's no drug that did this. And if there was a drug, it would be an absolute blockbuster cancer drug. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember those words. Yeah. Uh, what about saffron? Steve mentioned saffron. That seems to be a, a newer herb that seems to have some benefits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. A number of years ago, uh, I did some formulations for Douglas Labs. And, and the formula I created was actually the first formula for mood to have saffron in it. So it's something I've been interested in for many years. I, I first caught wind of it when I was looking for something to help patients who had uh, libido issues uh, with SSRI drugs. Okay. And there's some studies, albeit small, there are studies in men and women that show benefits for libido uh, when they're taking SSRIs. So sometimes oh. I, have, you know, I have a patient either can't get off a medication or really don't want to, but they want help with libido. And, um, and there's some research there. I mean, of course, we want to work on all the other underlying factors that contribute to libido. But when you see that um, clear SSRI induced change in libido, um, that's a reasonable choice to try. Right. Yeah. Um, lithium. I know you wrote a paper about lithium. Yeah. So lithium orotate, um, also known as nutritional lithium, so not lithium carbamate, the drug. Right. Um, is it just very small amounts, milligrams? You know, usually between five and twenty milligrams um, is 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 helpful. Um, I use it, um, you know, to help people with um, uh, typically like anxiousness, um, impulsivity, um, even in children. You know, a milligram, two milligrams, up to five can be helpful too. And um, and it's you know, and it's known. Um, as a, as a way to just help calm the amygdala, 
help calm that fear center of the brain, help it work better. Um, you can check it with hair analyses and see if levels are low or just start on low levels. I personally have never seen it affect kidney function or thyroid function the way the drug does. I think it's still a good idea to check those before and during just to make sure. But you know, I've been using it for years and I haven't seen any issues like that. Thank goodness. Um, in fact, I was on a um, on a group today. I was uh, teaching um, uh, uh, nurse practitioners and functional psychiatrists. And uh, one of uh, the fellows, I think it was a, a psychiatrist, had told me that he saw um, somebody go up to 30 milligrams and do quite well with it with no issues as well. So um, I, I hadn't actually used it at that high. Usually I don't go past 20 but um, he said 30 milligrams wasn't a problem, at least in the one patient he saw. So yeah, definitely very, very helpful. I actually like combining it with CBD. Oh, I find they okay. work really nicely together. Um, so supporting the endocannabinoid system, calming the amygdala uh, seems very helpful. And then there's specific amino acids and other nutrients to help support the various neurotransmitters. So we have like 5-HTP, we have um, Makuna mm -hmm. for, yeah. for dopamine, for uh, L-DOPA, um, we have uh, GABA. Um, what, what about some of those um, supplements? Yeah, you know, I mean, if you hear that, you know, when patients tell you that, you know, oh, I took a drug and raises dopamine, like Wellbutrin, for example, you know, which is very good at raising things like dopamine, then yeah, then it makes sense. Well, why not support the dopamine pathways more naturally right. if we can? And, and Makuna, which is a natural uh, amount of you know low levels of L-DOPA can be useful along with some tyrosine, which helps support the pathway to make dopamine. You know, of course, we always want the cofactors in there. We want vitamin B6, vitamin D levels, uh, zinc levels appropriate as well, because those are going to be really important for, for the body's ability to use those uh, materials to make the eventual neurotransmitters too. But yeah, those are great. 5-HTP um, to support um, serotonin, um, you know, sometimes I use tryptophan, sometimes I'll use 5-HTP. I find tryptophan helps people um, stay asleep better at night. So sometimes I'll use tryptophan at night, but 5-HTP during the day. I know some practitioners from a theoretical standpoint feel that if there's a lot of inflammation and they're going through that quinoloic acid pathway, um, you know, then maybe 5-HTP is a better choice. I, you know, I find it's really interesting, um, even though theoretically it makes sense, I've seen in practice not hasn't necessarily affected it. So I just try to use what's best and what I think is working for a patient. Interesting. Which which company do you get the tryptophan from? Uh, I've been using tryptophan from Douglas Labs. Typically. Okay. You know, they have a little bit of B6 in there. So it's okay. nice to, you know, if a patient isn't taking B6 or doesn't have enough level, then then that's helpful. Okay, good. Yeah. I think most of the um the uh, functional medicine um, supplement, professional supplement companies are carrying 5-HTP, but not so much tryptophan. Right. Yeah, I know. Tryptophan is a little bit old, <laughs> but I don't know. Well, it's you know, they took it off the market. I'm, I'm and, a little bit and, old. <laughs> uh, well, that that was um, that was a mistake. Right. Uh, you know, that was yeah. uh, purely because the company had introduced a bacteria there. In fact, it was interesting when I was re I did research when I was in my 20s, right out of college at the National Institutes of Health. It was like a, this sort of pre-doctoral fellowship. And um, and there was a doc in one of the labs I worked in. Her name was Esther Sternberg. And she was actually one of the people who testified um, because she was a well-known tryptophan researcher. So they brought her in to talk about tryptophan. And so she was one of the people that helped them understand that tryptophan itself doesn't cause eosinia, myalgia syndrome, this EMS, which about 30 or 40 people unfortunately died from. Um, but it was actually, um, you know, just the bacteria that was introduced by the company who I guess shouldn't have been making that because they didn't know exactly what they were doing. Right. Yeah. Okay. Very uh, unfortunate. Excellent. Any final thoughts um, you want to leave us with? No. Um, well, uh, what I would say is, um, you know, it's if if some if you if you're listening out there and you have mood issues, and and I know what they feel like because I've had some myself and I've been through a little bit, unfortunately too. Um, you know, at when you're going through it, it just feels like 
you know, nothing can help you. It almost feels like this monster from the outside who just, you know, comes and goes as he or she pleases and doesn't let you live the life you want to live. Um, you know, it's always worth looking for a practitioner who who will sit and listen to you and help look at these underlying issues. And I can tell you that there are things that can be done and it's always worth searching for them. And of course, if for any at any time you feel like you want to hurt yourself or something, please call a loved one. There's a, you know, wonderful hotlines, people who really want to listen and who care and who are there to help. Um, a- anybody on the call right now who wants to ask Peter a question, if you, you feel free to unmute yourself or type it into the chat box. Okay. And then um, how, how can um, uh, folks who listen to this uh, get a hold of you? Oh, yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. So my website is drpeterbongiorno.com. That's D-R-P-E-T-E-R-B-O-N-G-I-O-R-N-O.com. It's a very long name. <laughs> drpeterbongiorno.com. Yeah. So uh, feel free to all my contact information is there. Excellent. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And thank you for all the work you do and just, you know, having me on. And it's really an honor. And I appreciate everything you're doing, all the good information you're putting out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ben. Thank you for making it all the way through this episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast. For those of you who enjoy listening to the Rational Wellness Podcast, I would certainly appreciate it if you could go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and give us a five-star ratings and review. That way, more people will discover the Rational Wellness Podcast. And I wanted to let everybody know that I do have some openings for new patients so I can see you for a functional medicine consultation for specific health issues like gut problems, autoimmune diseases, cardiometabolic conditions, or for an executive health screen or and to help you promote longevity and take a deeper dive into some of those factors that can lead to chronic diseases along the way. Um, and that usually means we're going to do um, some more detailed lab work, stool testing, sometimes urine testing. Um, and we're going to look at uh, a lot more details to get a a better picture of your overall health from a preventative functional medicine perspective. So if you're interested, please call my Santa Monica White Sports Chiropractic and Nutrition Office at 310-395-3111 and we can set you up for a new consultation for functional medicine. I'll talk to everybody next week.